Right, now I told you last time that I was going to go through some basic bits and pieces in terms of, um, you know, just technical <coughs> meanings of words. Uh, but actually this next two or three slides are not hugely important in the academic sense. They are there for background primarily. Uh, loudness is the first one of those, and loudness is just determined by amplitude, all right? not by anything else. So far, we have only talked about very simple sine waves. So a single frequency, basically, uh, causing an oscillation. And the analogue on this slide is the one that's labelled A. Uh, it's labelled loudspeaker, right? which is not terribly useful since the rest of it could be coming through a loudspeaker. Um, but this is a loudspeaker where there is a single frequency being played, uh, played through. And we know what the amplitude is here, right? It's just that. That's straightforward. But if instead uh, we get a plucked wire, so imagine this is a guitar string, for instance, then we've not just got one frequency, we've got a whole mix of frequencies. But actually, this is the same loudness as that because the overall amplitude could be considered to be the same, right? If you sort of drew. Uh, a smoothed average, as it were, between these, you would get something of approximately the same uh, amplitude. And the same is true of something coming out of a flute, which is a somewhat simpler waveform, but the same sort of amplitude. Um, and this actually is, is noise that has comparable <coughs> amplitude as well. We'll go on to define what we mean by noise uh, in a few seconds' time. Uh, so again, these are basic terms, terminology. Right? The quality of a sound, technically, if you're a sound engineer, um, is to do with the number of frequency components within that sound. So if you were just playing one frequency, so if we go back to the sinusoidal wave on part A of that previous slide, then the note is deemed to be high quality. Right, so there's a lot of other stuff mixed in with it, <coughs> Excuse me, and I'll show you some examples of that in a second, uh, then the quality uh, will have gone down. So the fewer components in it, the higher the quality, basically. Uh, noise is just um, irregular displacements in our wave. Right? Technically random displacements. It doesn't have to be all random. Uh, the amount of noise is essentially a measure of the proportion of your sound wave, <coughs> which is random. Uh, and then a note is, is the converse of that, really. Um, a note is something that has a dominant frequency to it. Right? So minimum of randomness, in other words. Uh, and then the pitch is whatever that dominant frequency is. Okay, so let's have a look at a few examples from uh, musical instruments. These are all playing the same note. They're all playing concert A, right, which is 440 hertz. Um, so if you're tuning one instrument to another, these are all instruments in the orchestra that have been tuned right, to the lead violin or whatever it is they're tuning to on that occasion. Um, and they've all got roughly the same amplitude, <coughs> but they've all, as I say, got the same frequency in terms of what note they are. Uh, and it's just to do, again, with the dominant frequency associated with this waveform. Uh, right? The piano is relatively straightforward. It's a relatively simple uh, wave structure compared to some of the others. Uh, and you can see why. All right? The fundamental frequency is actually very strong in the piano. Um, and then the overtones are relatively weak. They're not zero, so this isn't a pure sinusoidal wave. It's got other things mixed in with it. Uh, but it's relatively straightforward. The violin, you'll notice, has a first overtone that's almost as strong as the fundamental. <coughs> right? And this thing out here, so what's that first, second, third, fourth overtone, is again really, really strong. So we've added lots of frequency components in to produce concert A from a violin. 
That's why it sounds different. Right? These are just pressure waves in air, remember? They sound different to our eardrums because we've got a different mixture of frequencies all coming out at the same time. And that's what makes a violin sound like a violin and not like a piano. Um, and likewise, of course, for flute, ca clarinet and trumpet. Right? All very, very similar, um, qualitatively. So they're all the same frequency, roughly the same amplitude, but because this distribution of frequencies from the fundamental through the overtones is different, they'll actually sound different as instruments, even though the note they're playing is exactly the same. So, as I say, that's a bit of background stuff. We're back to the more mainstream uh, physics now. And a first very important topic. Well, we know that waves carry energy, right? That's one of the very, very first things we established. Uh, and sound waves carry energy. Uh, and that's not hard to believe, I would imagine, since we have to put energy in to allow the speaker cone to make it move. Uh, and the pressure wave that comes out is actually moving your eardrum and the bones connected to it, right, through the nervous structure that is picking up that vibration, that takes energy, that all takes energy. Right, so the wave has to have had uh, energy. Now those wave sounds, if we imagine a point source, right, of a wave, it's always going to be a, an approximation if we're talking about loudspeakers, but you can imagine a very small um, speaker, Right, just think of you know your earphones that you put in, very small, spatially small source of sound. That's just going to spread out in all directions. Right, but the energy in each wave front is going to be the same. All right, so the total number of joules when your wave front is that size is exactly the same as the total number of joules when it's expanded to that size. So the amount of energy per square meter, if you like, of surface around this sphere that's spreading out from the source is going down. Total is the same, but it's spread out over a bigger area now. And those are things that we're going to have to take, uh, take into account. So the further you go away from the source of sound, uh, the less energy per square meter uh, that sound wave is going to be carrying. Total energy is conserved, that's all there the same. Right? We're assuming no loss of energy, remember, no friction in our system. But it's spread out more. Right? So that's why if you get closer to the source of sound, it sounds louder. Because the amount of energy impacting your eardrum, which is a particular surface area, will have gone up because the amount of energy per square meter has gone up. You're detecting, in other words, a higher proportion of the total if your eardrum is closer to the source of sound. And that's going to be one of the examples we've come across of the inverse square law, right? Come across that before? We did a little bit, touched on it, when we talked about radioactivity, actually, at the end of uh, last term's module. And it's just to do with the fact that we're spreading this out, this sound wave out, over a spherical surface. It's coming out from a point in our simple model. All right, and what's the area of a sphere? Well, it's proportional to the square of its radius. So double the radius, you multiply the area of that sphere by four. Still the same total amount of energy, remember. So the amount of energy per unit area on that spherical surface has gone down by a factor of four. Um, so that, again, is going to be something that we'll, uh, that we'll have to take account of at some stage. Anyway, let's look. Let's go back to you know, classic physicist units here. Let's look at the energy arriving uh, at a unit area in a unit time. Right, so energy is joules, if it's in unit time it's per second, if it's in unit area it's per square meter. Right, but joules per second is just watts, so we end up with watts per square meter. Right, and that is the intensity of a sound wave, watts per square meter. Right, and the area of course has to be 
just as we did in our definition of pressure, it is the area that is perpendicular to the direction of the wave. <coughs> All right, so um, let me find a little piece of chalk here. Stretch this out a little bit more. All right, so the power we've got is watts, it's joules per second. Right, that's the power in our wave. And the power then, um, sorry, the intensity rather. equal to power over the area. And that's essentially also what those units are telling you. So it's very much worth remembering that as an additional thing. Okay, now, our ears, I say our, probably yours, not necessarily mine, um, generally have a range from a few tens of hertz up to about 18 or so kilohertz. Um, those of you who are into hi-fi stuff will know that there is a perennial argument over whether it's worth getting a system that is responsive for beyond 18 kilohertz uh, or not. Um, but technically our ears just cannot pick up higher frequency uh, sound waves. Um, we are most sensitive, our ears are most sensitive in the region of about 3 kilohertz. Uh, which corresponds roughly to one of the dominant frequencies in uh, a human screen, particularly a baby's screen. If you want to get a sense of what that sounds like. Um, and at that frequency, so where our ears are at their most sensitive, we can pick up uh, an intensity of about 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter, so 1 picowatt per square meter. So it is, it's a very low intensity that we're detecting. Um, and if you think that your eardrum is only about 20 square millimeters in terms of its area, you can go and do this calculation. In fact, I might even set a problem for you to do it. Um, Actually, the, the amount of energy arriving at your eardrum for you to detect sound is incredibly small. Incredibly small. Um, but this unit is going to become really important for us, this one picowatt per square meter, because we're actually going to use it in a practical sense to define the start of a scale. All right, For everything we're doing, we've had measurement scales of one sort or another. This we're going to use in terms of uh, human hearing um, as the start of the scale. Um, however, if you get over a, a watt per square meter, your ears uh, will physically hurt. Right? That much energy being deposited on your eardrum will cause pain. But you'll notice the difference between the two. That's 12 orders of magnitude. These are really very good detectors of pressure waves in air that we've got. Uh, exceptionally good. So let's have a look at this graphically. Um, here's our crude description. This is coming from your recommended course textbook of the inverse square law. So we've got you know, intensity coming out of our speaker. And depending on where we're measuring it, so our areas are going up, as it were, for the same amount of energy. Uh, we get this effect uh, that intensity levels will go down the further away we are. But this is the key slide. This is our um, how low an intensity can we detect at a given frequency. All right, so we go to really, really low frequencies. We actually need an awful lot of energy before our ears will pick it up. And in a hi-fi system, that's actually where a lot of the power of your amplifier is going. It's going into producing the low-frequency notes because your ears are really inefficient at picking them up. This is round at our 3 kilohertz level. So this is the level at which our ears are most sensitive. So here, actually, we can pick up... Uh, this is in picowatts, you'll notice. We can pick up this level, notionally, of 1 picowatt per square metre. 
And then as the frequency goes up again, uh, the efficiencies of our ear is declined. Okay, so that's basically how it works. This stuff is in here purely for reference and revision if you need it. Um, by now, you should have covered all of this. You've all done logarithmic scales, yes? Someone please say yes or no? Yes? Right, good. Okay. So as I say, this is purely revision stuff in here, but it's there if you need it. Um, and it's there because we need to move from, if we're talking about perceptions of sound energy, we need to move from um, intensity to intensity levels. And the reason we have to do that is that our ears, although they operate over a huge range, they do so because they don't respond linearly to the intensity that's falling on them. Okay, so take the intensity up by an order of magnitude and we perceive a doubling of the intensity. Right? Two orders of magnitude we perceive a tripling of intensity. Right? We're just going up in decades as it were. So our ears are more or less responding logarithmically to the intensity that's coming in. Okay, it's only approximate, but it's a, you know, it's emerged as a reasonably useful way of doing it. So we're going to define um, our intensity level as log to the base 10 over whatever the intensity is, so number of watts per square meter, divided by this thing labelled in the equation as I naught, which is the minimum detected, detectable, I should say, uh, intensity. So that's the scale marker that I mentioned a couple of slides back. That is 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. So it's what we're going to use to normalize everything else. All our other intensities are going to be measured in units of 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. Um, so that in, in the context of sound, that I naught is always, 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 always going to be 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. Now later on, not in this module, but later on in your um, course or elsewhere in your course, you're going to think about these things in terms of intensities in electrical circuits and all sorts of stuff. All right? It's not then against the scale marker of 10 to the minus 12. Right? There will be different scale markers. But for what we're doing in the context of sound, it is always going to be that value. Now, uh, that's the, that unit is called the bell. Uh, you'll be well aware that that's hardly ever used. It's mostly the decibel that gets quoted. And the decibel, surprise, surprise, uh, is um, a tenth of a bell. All right, so the equation that you're going to use many times over uh, is this one right at the bottom here. So the intensity level get that, it's intensity level not intensity that's the differentiation between the two the intensity level then is 10 times log to the base 10 of whatever the intensity is divided by 10 to the minus 12 yeah and you will as I say be doing a lot of those calculations but just there's a couple more sort of generic things that I need to go through first so on this slide here, very similar to that, um, in some senses, to that graph I showed you earlier. Uh, so here's the minimum detectable uh, intensity level, not intensity now, intensity level on this scale. So this is in decimals. Uh, and you'll notice in about 3 kilohertz, that's where we get to our most sensitive region. All right. Most of the music you will listen to sits in that sort of region there. Vaguely. Right. Um, even the threshold of pain varies depending on frequency. But it's roughly at the 120 decibels level. <coughs> which corresponds to 1 watt per square meter, remember. All right. If the minimum 
right? If our scale starts at 10 to the minus 12, and I've gone up to 120 decibels, in other words, 12 bells, I've gone up 12 orders of magnitude. So if I've gone up 12 orders of magnitude on 10 to the minus 12, I've got one watt per square meter, yeah? So you should better move. I'm trying to get you in the habit of being able to move from one of these scales to the other, but you know, this is just an illustration. <coughs> Um, we can show graphically what some of these things uh, might mean. So here are our scales over here. This is our minimum detectable level down here. Right? One picowatt per square meter. This is in intensity, you'll notice, on this side. Uh, we go up to our pain threshold. One watt per square meter up here. All right? And on the other side, we've got the intensity level measured in decibels. Right? You'll notice the logarithmic correspondence, one side of the scale to the other. So at the low intensity level end, we're talking about, you know, really quiet chatter between people here, a normal conversation, a slightly abnormal conversation, uh, and then we get into the really loud natural stuff, uh, thunderstorms and so on, and then depending on your distance from it, you know, we're in the region of, of genuinely very, very noisy things. Uh, you know, this is why people have to wear ear protectors uh, in that in the vicinity. So again, we can look at it again. So here's intensity, here's intensity level. So here's our 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter, which is the start of our decimal scale. Um, and a few other things, I suppose, uh, as we go through what you might pick up in everyday life. Th this you can see is an American table, right? Um, so a pneumatic drill in our terminology, uh, standing close to it. So a meter is about the distance between the pneumatic drill and the ears of the person who's operating it. Um, we're up at 90 decibels already. And again, this is why ear protectors are uh, you know, this is the Queen concert that I went to, which is why I couldn't stay in the room for more than two tracks. Um, and we're at a point now, 50 metres away from a commercial jet, you would be in physical pain, serious physical pain. Uh, and actually shortly beyond that, and way before standing near the space shuttle at 50 metres, your eardrums will have burst. And this is just a pressure effect, right? We're just talking about pressure waves in air. But at about 160 decibels, the eardrum will, will burst. Okay? So this is just putting it into some perspective. Uh, so 160 decibels, uh, so that's now 16 orders of magnitude up. So we're, we're sort of next point up on that graph, aren't we? Okay, now, all we've talked about so far, or implicitly all we've talked about, is stuff that we can hear with our ears. But of course there are sound waves way out to either side, uh, in both directions. Uh, if we go to uh, high frequencies, so ultrasonics, um, there's a lot of stuff out there, um, commercially, apart from anything else. Uh, so, you know, upstairs in my lab, for instance, we've got ultrasonic baths, which will very efficiently keep, uh, clean small pieces of equipment. Uh, and they do that by bombarding uh, a fluid with your object in it with very high frequency sound, typically about 40 kilohertz. Uh, and the water actually can't respond um, uniformly, as it were, at that level. So at a surface, what happens is that you get cavitation form. So actually you get little vapour pockets, right? Um, mini explosions happening all over the surface of the thing, and that's actually what causes the cleaning. It's also, in terms of ships' propellers and so on, what causes uh, a lot of um, their um, erosion, their degradation. Because you can get high frequency uh, effects around um, the propeller blades, certainly at the tips and near the tips, and you get this cavitation forming. And if it goes on for a long time in a reactive medium like salt water, uh, you can begin to get pits being eroded into the surface, and that you know, will continue and degrade the uh, 
the prop, as you probably imagine. Um, we can use ultrasonics in medicine, of course. You'd probably be relatively familiar with that. There's a uh, sonogram of a, of a fetus shown at the bottom there to illustrate that. Uh, and that's essentially just using it as radar, so you're looking at reflected uh, uh, reflective waves. In fact, you can, you can be much more sophisticated than that, uh, as we'll come back to later on when we look at the Doppler effect. So you can use ultrasonic waves then not only to image something like the heart, but actually to uh, look at blood flow within it, just by measuring the Doppler uh, shift. But as I say, we'll come back to that as an illustration, uh, I hope, later on. Um, and you'll be aware that some, uh, some creatures use ultrasonics in terms of uh, echolocation. Uh, bats are the classic example of using ultrasonic frequencies to do exactly that. Uh, and at low frequencies, um, well, sound communication over long distances is much better done by, uh, at low frequencies. Which is why whales do it, right? Uh, one whale can call to another one on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. It, it's, it's that efficient. Um, and of course we get resonance effects at low frequencies as well. Right? The fact that, uh, well, there's all sorts of stuff we've talked about in terms of resonance. I will do that later on. Uh, but, you know, the fact that the Empire State Building has a resonance of, this is strictly from memory, uh, about an eighth of a hertz is quite important when the wind is at a particular strength from a particular direction in other words it's getting swirled around by other buildings in New York uh, the uh, Empire State Building will actually go into a resonance and it will move right? it's been properly built of course right, to dampen those down there are frictional forces uh, in that so no damage is done, but it's a, it's a discernible, uh, measurable effect. Uh, it's also how, uh, why elephants are so good at communicating with one another in the forest, or dense jungle. Uh, it's because they, they are able to produce these really low frequency sounds, incredibly low frequency sounds. And as you will know from your understanding of diffraction effects, right? means we've got a wavelength that is now uh, huge compared to the distance between the trees so we get less diffraction the sound is spread out less there's more directionality in other words to it and the elephants are actually able to locate each other uh, by picking up those low frequency sounds 